Okay, and good morning. We'll get kicked off this morning. We're just past 10 a.m. Uh, bear with us if we go through any instructions, as there are some people just joining the call. A um, few latecomers are always welcome, not a problem. Um, as you know, this morning's uh, webinar is a discussion on getting trade lines open. Um, as we all get back to business, uh, there's many aspects and many contacts that we have to support our clients through these difficult times. Um, and I'm really pleased to be uh, joined this morning by Mark Smith and Steve Hamster from Aon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Also joined by my colleague Nathan. Nathan works with me at Ward Hadaway in our commercial department, and he's a whiz on commercial terms, risk management, and putting processes in place to protect the business. So hopefully it'll be a really interesting chat this morning. Um, as you hover over your screen, you will see at the bottom that we have got a Q&A button. Um, anybody who sees me present in real life knows that I like a natter. Um, so this format where we can't actually see our callers um, is quite alien to us. Um, so please do use the Q&A button. If there's anything you want us to look at in more detail or you have some specific inquiries, hit that button, type us a quick message and we'll deal with that on the call as best we can or we'll give you a contact after the session. Um, the reason that we're looking at trade lines um, and how to get business going is that there have been some quite significant changes um, with the new legislation that's being passed. Um, but I promise this morning will not be a chapter and verse on the new legislation. I like it summed up in one easy paragraph and then let's get back to some practical advice. Um, so Steve and Mark, good morning again to you both. Um, for our callers this morning, we have a real uh, mix of attendee lists. We have uh, people who are just starting out in business or looking to diverse into a new, uh, diverse find to a new area. We also have some big businesses um, and also some intermediaries. But for those who are less aware of the product, could you go through what trade credit insurance is and how it can support a business? Steve, do you want me to pick this up? Yeah, are you... Are you sharing the slides mark are you able to do that i i will i let bear with me one second there we go is that seen by everybody there we go yeah okay so if i if i share that with you so in terms of, of credit insurance um it, effectively, it's a, it's a product which dates back uh, a, a great deal of time in terms of, of supporting businesses um, in the shape of, of support around uh, risk management, um, fees uh, offered to businesses uh, that support and protect their accounts receivable due from a loss. It's a product which, is that better? Okay. That is, yeah, it's, it's there to support. It's there to support businesses, um, drive growth, protect assets, um, protect the company's balance sheet in the event of a loss. Um, most of, of what the product delivers is supporting access to finance, supporting um, business growth. And in the current climate with COVID, we're seeing lots more companies looking to the product to um, protect their business, to protect shareholder uh, investment into that company, and then also accessing in potential new lines of, of business opportunities to grow that business post COVID. Um, it also provides businesses with an insight into risks um, that might be deemed low risk in, in terms of the business. Uh, it might be seen to be uh, optimizing opportunities to grow that business in certain markets which previously have been uh, either untapped or, or unexplored. Um, and then also it, it's used as a, as a product to to drive maybe growth in terms of financing. So accessing maybe new bank lines, um, investment into areas that perhaps historically have, have been, um, have been un, unable to, to kind of maybe even consider growth in, in particular markets such as export. What, what would I think, be the main differences uh, for a business using trade credit as opposed to something like invoice financing? I think um, from that perspective, I mean, if we look at credit insurance as a product, it's certainly evolved over the last decade. And I guess the um, financial crisis of 2008, 2009 has, has played a part in that. If there's a positive that came out of the financial crisis, it's given businesses access to information um, that's not readily available in the in the public domain. So from a 
from an invoice discounting point of view, I guess, from a receivables finance point of view, um, the ability to um, protect those receivables by credit insurance should lend itself to better rates through an ID facility. Sure. Um, where are we at in terms of stats for quarter one and how do you think this reflects the market and should affect things going forward? We all know I love a stat. <laughs> <laughs> and in anticipation of such, we've come prepared. So if, 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 if we look at sort of slide two, this is um, this is a slide just with the, the insolvency statistics from Q1 um, this year. And I guess, the, you know, the obvious is that they um, predate the, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. And we've seen in Q1 a decrease of 8.5% um, compared to Q4-19 and similarly a decrease of 8.5% from from Q1 2019, um, but by no way should that be a barometer for, for future failures, um, particularly given the economy sh pretty much yeah. closed for business um, as COVID-19 impacted um, the economy and we went into lockdown. Um, a lot of businesses have or continued to have supplier obligations, but without driving revenue and cash within the business, that in the event of, say, a U-shaped recovery, um, we forecast as an industry anything between 20 and 25 percent increase in business failure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting. We'll be looking next week at the market hotspots and those having significant downturns at the moment. You know, as you rightly say, anything going in there to to non-essential retail, etc., are going to take a huge hit. The people supplying into those kind of businesses certainly have have a significant risk moving forward um, as they try and get some momentum going again. Um, and I guess well, those that's are what a lot. A lot of what our clients are seeing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's stating the obvious, but construction and, and retail have been the um, have seen the biggest um, increase or, or biggest numbers in terms of failures, even as as recent as uh, or as up to date as today. Um, we envisage that go outdoors will will enter a administration, yeah. and that could uh, see sort of two thousand four hundred job losses. There's been talk about all saints, the um, the fashion retailer entering administration as well. So these businesses um, that we've mentioned there have already been in some form of distress um, as a result of Brexit uncertainty uh, and decreasing consumer confidence. Yeah. I mean, looking forward, uh, I know a lot of our clients use products from themselves, from other providers, um, but there was great concern about insurers starting to look at withdrawing cover um, and the government have intervened. Um, can you touch on the new scheme for us and how this is going to provide some security going forward? Yeah, Mark, can we just jump to, uh, I think it's um, slide four, the insolvency and claims forecast. Uh, there we go. Sorry, just a bit of background noise there. Yeah. There we go. So yeah, as, as, a, as an industry, um, it's an industry that's certainly grown in terms of gross written premium. Um, last year saw the industry attract 519 million in terms of gross written premium, and that's a rise of 17% from 2018. And that, that figure has sort of risen over the years as businesses have bought credit insurance for a multitude of reasons, whether it's just best practices to mitigate risk uh, using credit insurance as a sales enabler, or whether it's utilizing credit insurance to complement any funding facilities. Now, within the, the credit insurance market, we saw claims paid of 314 million last year, which represented a 25% increase compared to 2018. And interestingly, 10% higher than the 09 peak of, of 286 million as we came off the, the financial crisis. Yeah. We'll see into 2020, um, the impact of Thomas Cook failing in Q3 last year, because whilst that insolvency occurred last year, we'll see a trickle of claims paid into to Q1 of this year. Um, as an industry, it covers 360 billion turnover insured revenues, uh, and that's that's seen an increase as as well. Now, in terms of sort of underwriting in the face of the CV19 pandemic, um, we look at sort of the claims uh, paid against premium, and we we're sort of averaging a, a combined loss ratio of 60%. So for every pounds the credit insurer earns, they're paying out 60% in terms of claims. So at that level, probably bordering on loss making when you take into account yeah. other costs that the credit insurers face. 
So when reviewing and underwriting in the face of this pandemic, which is a non-financial event impacting the financial markets, the claims forecast for the industry is in and around 1.5 billion. So against that 500 circa million gross written premium, the insurers are potentially looking at loss ratios of 300%, which is, which is unsustainable as a market. So the thought process, the risk underwriting philosophy was to take out cover. So embark on a, a, a process of mass cancellations and reductions in cover in those high risk sectors, which you would deem as retail um, and construction, casual dining. Um, now that would obviously have a massive impact in terms of the supply chain. If you're, if you're a business, whether you're a new startup or an established business, the supplier have it saying to you that you would now go from say 60 day terms to cash up front is has a massive negative effect on on cash outflow so there's been discussions with um, with the abi uh, the association of british insurers uh, together with um, the treasury in terms of implementing a reinsurance scheme to present sorry to prevent those mass cancellations and keep credit terms cash conversion cycle moving so businesses are able to uh, to trade through so if we go on to the um is that going to affect new policies going forward or is that only the policies that have existence to date it will it will positively affect both so if we look at slide six mark i think it is in terms of we've just put a bit of detail with the scheme great thanks steve So interestingly, at the time of talking with you today, um, we still await sign off from the European Commission. We did expect this um, over the last sort of couple of weeks or so, but there's been a few um, issues that have prevented that from going ahead, but we, we don't see any reason why it, it shouldn't. So basically it's a reinsurance scheme, assuming sign off that will um, retrospectively uh, commence from the 1st of April. All insurers, with the exception of oh, I think Steve's there. Sure, have indicated that they wish to scheme. Um, have I gone now, Ever? Yeah, you just dipped out. Who was the exception, Steve? Sorry, you just dipped out at that point. So yeah, there's a there's a multi-line insurer by the name of Chubb who will not part participate and they're quite it's slightly different from them with credit insurance their intention um, to participate in the scheme so it's basically a 10 billion sterling reinsurance scheme um, and the insurers interestingly will forbear 90 percent of their premium income from the 1st of april in order to attract this 10 billion pounds worth of cover sure. so what it's aimed what it's aimed to do is obviously prevent those mass cancellations and reductions in cover. And where some insurers have already undertaken those mass reductions and cancellations, they should reinstate those limits that have previously been reduced and cancelled. Okay. I mean, Emma, so Emma, I was just going to say, I mean, what it, what it doesn't do is turn a bad risk into a good risk. I think that, that's key for, for us to kind of point out, really. Certainly the insurers that do participate in the scheme um, will have uh, certain constraints around them in terms of being able to pay bonuses, um, dividends to shareholders. So it is a scheme which has consequences for insurers, but ultimately it's there to effectively provide comfort back to the industry as though COVID hasn't happened. Yeah, okay. We talk a lot about the changes that have happened and as we know we're waiting um, for the, the reinsurance scheme to, to get sanctioned by Europe at the moment, um, which will come on to the dreaded Brexit a little later on this morning. Um, I know everybody uh, has been has buried that for a few months while we've dealt, dealt with matters domestically. Um, but certainly when uh, you know I become involved in, in claims as a, as a litigator, a lot of it turns around the clauses within a contract and a lot of my clients will look to uh, contractual terms that enable them to terminate contracts if there's delays in payment, if, uh, if clients, customers aren't taking the same level uh, of product as being agreed under those contractual terms. And I think under the Corporate Governance Bill, there's, there's been a huge hotspot and concern um, on the market about the government's plans to stop clients from using those contractual terms 
um, if they have suspicion that, that their customer is under financial distress. Um, I only argue over them. The man in the know who actually drafts these contracts uh, is Nathan. Nathan, can you talk us through the new provisions, please? Yep, can do. So the, uh, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill, as it currently is, came was, was put forward on the 20th of May, and we're waiting for it to come in uh, before the end of the month. Um, it, it isn't going to be an act in its own right in that it won't, it'll actually amend the Insolvency Act of 86 and the Companies Act of 2006 um, with, with new provisions. The, first, the, the main three things it's going to do is it's going to include a new uh, monitorium process. It'll also have a new restructuring plan and also um, it'll include the ipso facto clauses, which is, is what you're mentioning, Emma. Um, in terms of the moratorium, that's going to be a 20 day period where businesses can enter it if, it's, if they are or they are uh, likely to become unable to pay its debts. Um, that 20 day period is proposed by the directors and can be filed out of court or with a court order. Um, and can be extended. It can be extended by an initial tw further 20 days and with the consent of creditors or the court, it can be extended up to, 20, uh, to a year. And the new restructuring plan will sit alongside what's currently in the Insolvency Act um, and that's going to be interesting to see how that goes because that will actually build on, on, on case law and experience in terms of uh, restructuring plans where um, debtors approach their creditors with a plan. So it'll be interesting to see how that one develops. In terms of the clauses, um, the, the idea is that um, clauses that in a contract give a debtor or usually the supplier the right to terminate because of an insolvency event will no longer be able to apply. So if the, the only reason for the, the, the termination right is the insolvency, um, therefore the, the, you, that can't be the trigger anymore for the termination. Um, what you need to bear in mind as well is that um, it, it, it's not a case of somebody can stop paying your, your outstanding invoices and therefore can just ignore them and therefore can insist on the supply. As you're probably aware, there are certain supplies of, of goods and services that automatically this, this sort of thing applies to, such as um, utilities. Um, but this, this new, uh, new way of, of, of approaching it is that you're looking for what that trigger is and if it's solely because of the insolvency the clauses will no longer apply you've probably all seen the sort of clauses which you know down usually is boilerplate you've got usually a, a termination for convenience either party can terminate for 30 days notice and then you've got the ones that say if one party goes bankrupt if they're an individual yeah. if they enter administration uh, also if there's a suspicion that they can't meet their debts those sorts of clauses are the ones that are going to be interesting because they aren't actually insolvency trigger it's more an, a, a suspicion of one of the parties and that's really where you need to look at these sorts of clauses to make sure that they don't just stop you um, receiving money if there's an insolvency it's just the insolvency itself that's the trigger so you need to look at how they've been drafted Okay, so early advice, as soon as you get suspicion, could enable you to manoeuvre around those clauses a lot more effectively um, than, than allowing that situation to, to continue and obviously potentially causing cash flow issues um, if you're allowing that to ride. And I think the one thing that we really want people to take away today is that we are all on the end of the phone. These are difficult times. Pick up the phone and see whether those, uh, those clauses um, can come into play, how we can manoeuvre around them. As you start to trade again, that's the time when those contractual provisions can be looked at and renegotiated because everybody's working on a very different playing field now. Um, so there tends to be a lot of bargaining positions between the parties who are trading together. Um, and I think also, um, certainly last week when we were looking at more of the insolvency side of things, um, you know, there was a lot of questions being asked by our listeners in terms of um, how do they overcome that? So, if you're continuing to trade with customers, for example, um, who aren't paying promptly, how can that prejudice the insurance cover that may be in place? And perhaps Stephen, Mark, you can talk our listeners through how you approach it from a 360 point of view to help secure and protect the business. You want me to take this one, Mark? Yeah, you can do. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously we're awaiting confirmation from the insurers um, there's been some papers released and we're expecting further today just in terms of how the bill um, affects those businesses that choose to credit insure particularly in um, 
an area whereby there's supplies um, into a business, um, whether that business is in moratorium, because um, what you would see typically is any payments received um, post what we term as an insolvent event would be allocated chronologically against the oldest amount outstanding. Now, if suppliers in a position whereby they've got by law to fulfill those obligations, um, then what the insurers will look to do is allow those monies received post insolvent event to be allocated to the to the deliveries that are made during that state of insolvency or moratorium. Yeah, sure. So it's it's a it's a moving piece. We know the bill um, is a couple of days away from from going live, um, and we're in discussions with the insurers on a on a regular basis, um, as recent as yesterday, just in terms of impact to policyholders. So if there's any business, any individual on the call that utilises credit insurance, we'd suggest speaking to, obviously, Intermediary being the broker and um, chosen credit insurer, just to understand how that impacts their policy. Sure, and also looking forward, as I say, I think with uh, the domestic issues that have uh, been ongoing, um, the, the dreaded Brexit, which we all got a little jaded about, um, has been swept under the carpet. But with news that there's going to be no further extension on transition, which is due to take place at the end of December, let's wait and see on that. Um, how's that going to affect the market in international trade? I think we've seen, if we look at the global economy, 2019 saw just a, a mere 3% um, growth. And I think the original forecast for 2020 was 3.4% growth. Now, if you look at um, global GDP, those numbers have been um, revised down accordingly. I guess with Brexit, and you're right, we have, in the face of CV19, kind of just disregarded it in our industry. Um, Brexit was mentioned on a on a regular basis, and we were encouraging clients, um, prospective businesses, our introducer network, to almost formalise a, a Brexit plan. Whether we achieve a deal or no deal, to have some form of planning ahead. Um, and the insurers were no different because they were mindful of the fact that, with the uncertainty that Brexit um, brought. There's highly leveraged businesses that were, of course, going to struggle to refinance. We've certainly seen an increase in what we term as zombie companies, those businesses that are not generating sufficient profit to pay down interest on debt, let alone the debt pile. So I guess in some areas, the positive for the market has been that the risk underwriting um, philosophies that they've deployed have taken into account um, Brexit implications on UK businesses selling to UK businesses, um, UK businesses selling into the EU and, and the wider overseas markets, um, which which if you look at the um, the overall underwritten level of cover, um, probably reflects that, that process. Oh, and I think also for our, our readers, as we say, although it can sometimes be quite a heavy uh, subject. Really, these kind of policies are there to help cash flow, and that's what keeps the businesses turning. Um, you know, they, they do say you can only run out of cash once in a business, whereas uh, you can tend to manoeuvre around those problems um, as you trade along. Um, but I think also it's just worth noting that at the moment, HMRC um, are an unsecured creditor, the same as any other creditor. So if you're supplying into a business at the moment, um, you are in a situation where you would fall equally with HMRC. The proposals at the moment are that by December, HMRC will become a preferred creditor, so they will get their slice of the action before the unsecured creditors get, get paid out. So that is potentially an issue that insurers are going to have to think about as well in terms of recoveries on insolvency. It's going to affect the market, but it's just getting ahead of the ball on that and not allowing those debts to accrue by the customers you're supplying into. And when Steve and Mark talk about the 360 view of the organization, it's about good management. And what we're hearing from insurers, from our finance um, intermediary contacts, it's about demonstrating that you're considering how you're running the business, that you've got good processes in place, that you're in control and you're making wise decisions. There's certain things out of your control in business and it just, um, we're having to all adapt to these new times. Um, but it really is a global look at the business. And looking at that, Nathan, I know that you actually work in-house for some major organisations as well on uh, secondments going and assist them when they need more than interim ad hoc advice. 
What would your advice be in terms of implementing risk procedures, assessing risk, good processes in the business? Yeah, I think I think it's a case of, you know, we, we lawyers, particularly we who draft contracts, hate it when a contract's drafted and then put in the bottom drawer and forgotten about. Contracts need to be living documents and therefore in terms of risk, courts increasingly over the last sort of two years, we've seen cases where courts are always going to say they're going to look at the contract, not what's happening in practice. So maybe a case over the last, you know, the last six months, you've agreed something with the other side on the back of a fag packet over the phone. Make sure that what you've agreed with them, particularly where you're talking about risk and in terms of where the risk lies between the two parties, is, is put in the contract. Whether that's a short form letter amendment to the contract or whether that's even terminating the contract and starting afresh with new agreement. Um, so therefore, in terms of looking at the risk, looking at where, where the risk is, whether it's a case of you, you've decided in terms of payment terms, rather than wait 30 days, you're asking for money up front or a proportion of money up front, proportion on delivery, and then a proportion um, after the 30 days. But whatever you've done sort of to muddle through, if you like, through this, this period, that that's now reflected in your documents. Um, what a lot of people have assumed as well is that they, they've just thought, oh, well, this is an act of God, and therefore the force majeure provisions will protect me. When, they, if, when you actually read them, they don't. What they, they often will say is that there's a period during which um, the, the, the act of God being, being the virus here will just delay the performance of a contract. It doesn't terminate it. So in terms of risk as well, don't just sit back and assume that the risk's over because this has just terminated your contract or there's been a frustration of the contract because that's not necessarily the case, particularly if it's just made the contract harder to perform. So now's the time to be doing sort of a health check in terms of your contracts and your relationships to make sure that whatever steps you've taken to get through this are now reflected in documents. And also it's a case of now thinking going forward, how has the business changed? Where are our risks now? A lot of businesses now will be doing more online. So the risks now in terms of cybersecurity, more data protection risk, looking at those and how your documents reflect those risks and how you're protecting yourself from that point of view. Yeah, sure. And although sometimes, as I say, it feels quite heavy, and I think um, I was talking to the CDI this morning, and they're saying, you know, for business owners, it's not about expecting them to know all of the answers. You know. We, we, we don't know every aspect of, of each other's businesses, so that's not our job to do that. We are trained to help people legally. These guys are trained to help people in terms of the insurance market, accountants, uh, you know, finance companies. There are so many different organisations you can pull on to give you that advice. And the quicker you get that advice and you're more proactive in the management, the better. Um, and although, as I say, it does seem quite a heavy subject this morning, um, let's finish on some good news. So. Uh, can you give us some good news stories with the kind of organisations you've been working with and help to support these? Yes, I'll uh, I'll pick this up. I'll just share my slides again. Bear with me. Okay, I, I think the first thing for, for me to kind of touch on at the moment is it's important for businesses of all sizes to engage with the credit insurance market when requested. So where suppliers uh, are insured themselves, um, Credit insurance is is playing uh, a very important part in, in the way businesses at the moment are getting back to hopefully some normality. Um, so we're seeing here that, that, that credit insurers uh, will be requesting financial financial information from businesses, up to date MI in the midst of, of COVID, um, not necessarily lying on 2018, possibly even 2019 accounts now. So it's important for businesses to be open and, and upfront with insurers in order to maintain that, that supply chain. So that's the first thing to say. In terms of the four areas that, that Aon concentrate on in terms of supporting businesses, um, it falls into a 360 methodology. So if we take the red hexagon um, on the right hand side, the trade receivables, uh, working with, with businesses to either look at it from a risk transfer perspective or it's to drive access to more forms of finance um, that's the first and, and kind of obvious kind of step for, for us to take in terms of supporting businesses um, there was a recent example where a business was looking at increasing their invoice discounting arrangements increasing it from say three million to five million um, in order for the bank to offer the facility that that they required credit insurance was stipulated as a requirement on that arrangement so that would allow the financier to increase the 
advances from 85 to 90 percent um, and the business in question took that policy the bank's obviously protecting itself by having the credit insurance in place um, and therefore felt more confident to offer the facility of, of that size which was perhaps outside of credit initially moving to the next stage which is something steve and i work um quite quite extensively on in terms of dealing with businesses is collateral replacement um, it's it's not a subject which um is commonly aware of in terms of surety as a solution so for us to kind of demonstrate there are solutions out there alongside traditional bank products such as bank guarantees letters of credit there are options where the applicant is well graded themselves to use the surety market and the surety market just to keep it a simple high level it's not insurance it's a finance tool for treasury effectively the solution itself um, means that we're replacing bank guarantees with a surety backed solution freeing up credit lines so if you've got a revolving credit facility and you've got a five million guarantee in there it's about reversing that out placing it with the surety market and freeing up that five million valuable working capital in that business and essentially it's a tri-party relationship between the surety the beneficiary of the bond and then the principal the applicant um, in terms of pricing as well on these deals from my experience in the last five or six years with Aon um, it is Oh, we just lost your time out. Is more cost effective using the surety market, the bank world structure. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Emma. You, am I back on? You're back on. Ah. I'm not sure if it's mine or yours. <laughs> uh, it's um, the counter indemnity would normally normally be requested by the surety in the event that the bond is called upon, giving them recourse to the top co within that business. And I'll give you an example. It was a, a large energy generator recently in the last 18 months where we freed up 5 million in the revolving credit facility by replacing a letter of credit requirement with effectively a surety, a surety bond. Um, we placed that, it was quite specialized, the wording was quite bespoke, uh, but it was with a company called Alexon. And as, a, as an energy generator, stroke trader, stroke supplier, um, they are required to post collateral, either in the shape of cash, in the shape of guarantees or letters of credit. And what that did, it freed up that 5 million within that business. So it was a real tangible benefit to that client. And we're now talking to them about other areas within Aon in terms of our capabilities. There are other solutions as well, such as a surety around due to deferment guarantees with HMRC, where you're required to, to effectively delay payment by 45 days. And the same with letters of credit under deductible guarantees for, say, employers' liability or even fleet policies as well. Moving around the, the, the loop here, you're then looking at trade receipt, uh, tra trade payables, I should say. So this is where credit insurance is used to effectively allow you to obtain better terms from your suppliers or even financial institutions that you're working with. Um, supply chain finance being an area, allowing you to pay suppliers early um, and then extend payment terms back to the financier, anything up to say 90 days or even 120 days. So effectively giving you that ability to control what cash you've got in the business for longer. Um, an example of a solution we put in place was a corporate credit card for a very large business. Um, it was circa, I think, a 50 million credit line that we obtained, and it allowed them to pay that supplier immediately and therefore then pay the, the financier back over extended terms. So that's an area that, that we focus on using credit insurance around the, the trade payable side. And then lastly, just mindful of time, um, looking at investments and, and acquisitions, um, deferred consideration, using an example where maybe a corporate is acquiring something um, and they're wanting to hold on to as much cash as possible. So it might be 100 million, as an example, 100 million acquisition, um, and they're looking to keep a proportion of that cash back in the business and, and offering a surety bond to effectively to support that beneficiaries. Um, purchase of that acquisition. So there are different ways of, of structuring those deals 
Um, it's not just about using credit insurance in its vanilla form, that there are different solutions out there to support working capital within businesses. Yeah, thanks, Mark. As you say, I'm, I'm conscious of time because we promised these callers that we'd only be on for half an hour. Um, but just to say, you've heard the flexibility that's out there. Um, and I know that working with AON is great because they are the same ethos that we at World Hathaway are in terms of wanting to engage with our clients, be out in the business community, be part of your companies. So please don't suffer in silence. Um, whether you are starting a new venture, whether you're looking to diversify, or in fact now ready to ramp up and expand in new or existing areas, please do give us a call. We just want to hear from you. Uh, let us know what your challenges and successes are. Um, you all have my email, emma.digby at wardhadaway.com. Um, the email also has my contact details on, so pick up the phone, have a chat, send me an email, and I'm happy to divert any queries for you as well. Um, it's such an in-depth and, for me, very interesting subject area. Um, so, you know, we've only just been able to give you a whistle -top a stop tour this morning. Um, so if you want some more information, please do contact me and I'll make sure that I signpost you in the right direction. So all that's left is for me to thank Nathan, Mark and Steve for joining me this morning. And uh, finally, to all of you, thank you for your time. I appreciate, as always, your support. Hope it's been of use. Uh, next week, I'll be joined by Darren Hurst from Julius Bear. We'll be looking at hotspots in the market in terms of investments and growth areas. So it will be another good uh, and in in interesting one. Darren's always great to have on the team as well. Um, but as I say, really appreciate Steve and Mark joining us this morning. Another interesting webinar. Thanks, gents. Many Thank thanks you. to our callers. Bye. Thank you.